this man has been on New York television for 28 years. But, pish posh, we're going to lay that aside. Because tonight, he has reached the pinnacle of his broadcast career. (laughs) By appearing right here on the Joe and Joe Weather Show podcast, which is brought to you by Tempest by Weatherflow. Get the revolutionary Tempest weather system, and you too can join the fastest growing observing weather network on the planet. The link is on the descriptor to this podcast, and if you purchase this or anything else from the Tempest website, uh, be sure to use the coupon code WINTER2324 because you will not only get Joe Rayo 10% off, but Our guest will come to your house and install the Tempest weather station (laughs) himself. He will bring his tools and and put and put it there, put it up there for us. So welcome everybody tonight on this really special Joe and Joe weather show. I've been uh, nervous all day about this because we have uh, the great Lee Goldberg on. Uh, Lee, I hope you have a sense of humor. I tend to do, you know, this sort of off kilter humor along the way. So. Just follow me along, and then write me nasty notes afterward when uh, when the show's done. No, I really felt like uh, you know Matt Damon and Jimmy Kimmel. I just thought I kept getting bumped all these years. Well, you know <laughs> the, the the list the list that of those that have appeared is just it's all so long. It's too numerous, too many names to mention. Um, and yes, you know you have to wait your turn, but you know you're here. No. <laughs> I'm kidding, folks. Okay, I'm kidding. We are so thrilled to have you here. And, Thank you. And um, so I, I want to start this off because you know, one of the things that came to mind uh, came to my mind today that I think all I think all weather people have it in common, and I think all TV weather people have it in common is a sort of desire from an early age to do what it is we do. And I, I was kind of wondering about that with you. You know, how you, we all have stories. We were 10 years old. We were 12 years old. So I'm really interested in, in, in hearing, you know, how, how it all came for you when you woke up one morning as a six-year-old and said, I'm going to be on WABC TV when I grow up. You were close. It was five. Uh, it was the blizzard of 78, hands down. I mean, I was a kid in the suburb of Boston. So, you know, um, a little kid, first grade, uh, wake up to two to three feet of snow. Uh, school's closed for a week. You're building snow forts. You just, you know, you're amazed at the power of the weather. Uh, and it just, it never stopped. Um, dad bought me a weather station for my birthday, put it on the roof. So like you said, I mean, if you want, if you want to tell your people, I'll put that Texas Instruments weather station on their roof. I, I have to, you know, pay it forward from my dad who did it for me and set up that weather shop downstairs was a weather watcher for the great meteorologists like uh, Harvey Leonard and Dick Albert, Boston local paper and uh, cable vision said, Lee, could you come over and do an interview? And Hey, we have a green screen. Would you like to go on air? So it's, uh, 13, grabbed my bar mitzvah suit, started doing weather coverage for our local cable station in Canton, Massachusetts, and uh, it just did never edit from there. There there was nothing else I was ever going to do. Well, you just triggered a memory for me, Lee, because uh, I remember very well. I'm sure Joe does, too. Well, Joe is an intern at the National Weather Service in New York for the 78 storm, but I remember uh, I used to like to DX. I'd listen to out-of-town radio stations, and one of the uh, I used to do air checks. I used to tape record weather forecasts from other cities way outside of New York. And oh, one, wow. of them, one of them was Don Kent, who was a sure. living legend of, of Boston on WBZ. And I still have his forecast just as the storm was beginning to rev up in, in February of 1978. So I was probably the only kid in the Bronx who knew who Don Kent was. But anyway, <laughs> but I think that's, what you said was we, we all got started uh by by a major weather event such as the blizzard of 78 um i don't know about joe but mine goes back to uh the blizzard of 69 the 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 Lindsay storm of 1960 Mm -hmm. which uh, we're coming up on the anniversary of that in a couple of days so whatever Mm -hmm. whatever happens that triggers uh your interest uh that's how that's how the ball i guess gets gets starts gets gets rolling here 
No, I, and I just kept getting channeled in. I mean, it, you fast forward to to college, and it was the blizzard of '93 that I was thrust into overnight coverage as a junior in, in, in college and working at a Syracuse station. And we did coverage on the blizzard of '93. And I'm okay. I mean, this is, and I mean, I, I, my career is charmed. <laughs> well, are, I, you, are, you a, are you a big snow fan? Are you? I I know Alan Casper, who Joe mentioned. When we loved, I, I, Joe way, he's, and, he's watching tonight. Oh, great! I, I, oh, I, yeah. sent, I sent him the right YouTube on. link, and if he and if he found it, he, he's watching. Because uh, I, I mean, told him the Harvey Leonard story. All of all of us, all of us who were snow freaks or weather snow weenies or whatever, who loved snow, we watched Alan. We, in fact, some of us even referred to him as God, <laughs> because he. <laughs> He he was and and he also showed on on Channel Two and Channel uh, W uh, N E W Fox Five here in New York that he indeed really loved dynamic weather and snow, and so we all got excited when he started to make an allusion to the fact that there could be a big snowstorm coming. So I'm I'm just wondering with you, where are you still a big snow fan, or has have you mellowed over? Uh, all no. The no, I, because you you know you you don't know what you're missing until you you know you've lost it and these you know pathetic winters that we you know we've just gone through here this year and last year. I never thought we'd have uh, as bad a winter as the oh one oh two winter where I think we just got a little over three inches and and here we are the last couple of years here. So no, give me a big snowstorm any time. I mean, listen, I, I know that there can be. Um, the downside, the impacts, the coastal impacts, but give me a, you know, a big snowstorm because it, what shuts down New York city more than uh, it's like a blizzard or Christmas. It's, it's the same kind of feeling in the middle of the city when that happens, you know, versus any of these catastrophic flood events or wind events. I'll take a snowstorm anytime. I, I got to tell you just from a personal standpoint, I'm not, I don't want to be, I don't want to sound here like I'm, you know, suddenly reaching out to the, 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 the heaven, the godly heavens. Um, but I have always found, well, two things. First of all, uh, I, I think I think most people that are coming of age now, okay, and grew up in that period uh, between 2000 and 2020 were really spoiled. I mean, that was just 20 years of you know incredible storm after storm after storm, and actually it was great from a forecasting standpoint because. You really didn't have to struggle all that much. Everything played out according to you know your your best your best snow lovers' hopes. Mm -hmm. never, I, I've never really understood. You know, there's some people that just do not like snow, and and for me, I, I I've always found even as a, as a kid the the January 1920 storm in in 78, the blizzard of 78 that followed. Um, a lot of my TV memories, you know aspiring to want to be a television person uh, and remembering Alan Casper's broadcasts. Um, I've never forgotten it in 78 when he came out in the January, the third, the, um, I think it was, it was it a Thursday night show or Friday night? Uh, no, it was a Thursday, it Thursday, was a Thursday night. night. I thought so. Yeah. I remember yeah. coming on a Thursday night at 11 o'clock and talking about the fact that um, Atlantic city was about to, you know, lose its low level, you know, lose the, uh, the low levels and change over to rain. But they had already put about half, you know, they had already put several inches of snow on the ground. And he upped his accumulation, which at that point, the Weather Service was playing catch up. You know, it was sort mm -hmm. of like they started with little to no accumulation. Then it was a coating to an inch. Then it was one to two inches. Then it was two to four. And Alan jumped it up to like six to eight plus. And I remember just being so incredibly happy and then waking up the next morning. Uh, and, 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 and the thing is, I've always found something about snowstorm when it ends in the very early morning hours or right before dawn and you go outside and there's that that quiet, that eerie quiet. I've always said that, you know, if you if that's when God really speaks to you, you know, uh, in, 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 in that quiet, there's such serenity and peace. And there's that moment where everything just looks gorgeous, you know, for about. 30 minutes and then the plows come <laughs> and then and then the right. salt is thrown and all the rest of it but i i think it's I, I i don't i think it's pretty much inherent anybody that does what we do we just all love snow mm -hmm. no it's a the 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 snow anticipation which 
you know, actually maybe a little too exaggerated in these days, you know, especially if you're in broadcast meteorology, but the idea of, um, the anticipation for the storm, the, sometimes I just like to forecast it and leave it. Um, so to, to go through some of the agita, we're like, you know, oh, we're not going to verify. Oh, no, wait, no, we, we, we got the deformation zone. We're good. We're going to verify it. So that stuff can be difficult, but no, there's, there's nothing like it. Um, you know, the, it's still in this air, in this time of, you know, diluted media, it still, you know, draws the eyeballs when we're going to get a snowstorm. Um, so I, I, you're completely right. Again, like Christmas morning to me is the same way you described the morning after snowfall. You, 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 Joe, you, uh, you uh, I like, uh, go ahead, Joe. I'm sorry, but I gotta, I, I gotta I, come back to that phrase he just used. Yeah. I, I just want to do a little plug for Lee. Lee, of course, has a podcast, um, whether or not. And I believe that this week's topic, Lee, is, uh, is talking about what the situation is in New York or in the Northeast or whatever about this winter season in, in regard to snow and will we ever get a significant snowfall or see any any significant snow for the balance of this winter season is that am i correct i haven't had a chance to see the podcast yet but uh it's it's out there and i would hope that everybody on the chat board and everybody who's watching right now uh tunes in and uh watches lee and his uh interesting uh topics on weather me- meteorology and uh i think that's your topic for this particular week as uh what what what's going to happen for the remainder of the winter? Is, am I correct or? Yeah, I appreciate you mentioning that. Well, weather or not has really become a labor of love. You know, it's, it's sort of as we sort of find our way and in, into this new you know streaming world and podcast world. It's it's uh, it's a great friend. I mean, listen, you guys have mastered it already. It's it's fun to be able to to get on there and and uh, dive into these topics a little deeper. And and in this particular one. Uh, I think that's what everybody is asking, especially through the next, you know, four days where we're going to have temperatures in the 50s, if not a near record high Saturday, is uh, are the ducks on the pond for for a return of winter chill? So we we dive into that. And the, the short answer is, yeah, I, th- I think there are opportunities going forward. Will we will it be as will the cold be as severe as the January 15th to 21st? Maybe not. But that doesn't mean there's not enough cold air for some snow. So right. it, it doesn't uh, mean I am mean. looking forward to that. I, right. I, I want I want to touch on what you just said, though, because this is. This is something that I've come to learn to deal with, and I think maybe I was early in how to deal with it, uh, but you mm-hmm. said you used the term diluted media, and mm-hmm. there's this sort of, well, I you know, there's a couple of battles going on. One is the fact that you have all sorts of people throwing up all sorts of maps to which we all have access to. Uh, particularly snow maps, which I have said are, are probably one of the most useless things uh, there there is out there. I mean, they have there is some use to them, but not in the way they're being used. Mm-hmm. And so you have that, and then you have what I often refer to. Well, I always refer to these people, and I'm sure you get them, Lee. You have to get them. What I call forecast shoppers. And I, I, I want to know the answer to this question because I always get, for example, well, how come you're saying this? But and then <laughs> fill, in, fill, in, fill in the blank, fill in the blank. Lee Goldberg is saying this. Craig Allen is saying this and on right. and on and on. So I want to ask you, does anybody ever come to you and say, well, Joe Chaffee says, you know, that we're going to get this. Do they ever? But I, not specifically that they say me, but yeah. I, I abhor forecast shoppers. It's like why yeah. does why do you have to compare? I'm telling you what I think. Okay, I don't I don't necessarily <laughs> care what the other person thinks. This is what I think. Okay, so why are you asking me about what somebody <laughs> else thinks when I don't even talk to that other person? Joe's getting hot. Yeah, I get it. I get it. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, there's some things that I just, um, have kind of said, this is, this is going to come with the territory. Um, you know, uh, the amateur snow maps that are coming out now for early next week. Um, you know, we, it, what's funny is you could have a million great comments and, and thoughtful comments and social media. And then it's the one that, that gets under your skin that bothers you the whole day. And yes. I do respond to it. I'll say, listen, you know, I'm not sure what person X is calling for. Respect them as a meteorologist. 
you know, this is the way I see the storm after I've analyzed things and, and good night. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, I can't spend too much time. Well, on, but I, yeah, what, sure. It's, what, it's what, I've done, what I do sometimes when I get somebody, when I, when I get somebody that, you know, cause you wind up, even when you get the forecast, right, you wind up right. getting lumped into a barrel where somebody else got it wrong. So obviously you must've got it wrong too. Right. And, right. And they'll, and they'll, you know, make some really nasty remark. And I usually say my weather, I usually write back and say, my weather page is not for you. You need to go to a, you need to go to a weather page, <laughs> you know, that that is, you know, at your level, at, at more at your level of intelligence. If you'd like, I'd give, I can give you a long list. And then a couple <laughs> of times, and then a couple of times I've said it where I said, you know, it's so clear that the, at your education level of meteorology is almost non-existent, but let me recommend <laughs> Let me recommend a book for you, and I put a link to Joe Rayo's chi- uh, child media uh, weather book that he, that he has. <laughs> I put an Amazon link, so hopefully, Joe, somebody made a purchase and you got some commission out of it. Uh, but yeah, it, 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 it drives yeah. me crazy because this is the sort of stuff. Certainly, when we stood, Joe and I coming up in our in the bulk of our careers, you know, certainly it wasn't until really after until we got to the 2000s that we started to have to deal with all of this. And, and, and yeah. it, it can really sometimes it just gets to me and then eventually, uh, you know, the bad feeling passes. But that that to me is probably the, the hardest part of the, the whole job now is not putting out the forecast, but having to deal with being up close and almost personal with 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 um, with fans out there. And it's great when they're not, you know, it's great when they're civil. It, it's it, it's wonderful when they want to have a conversation with you. Uh, but it but it's horrible when when they get they get mean and nasty and vicious. No, it's, uh, you know, I, at, at one time, I really one thing I loved about the career and, and a lot of people aren't fortunate enough to have this in their careers that you're getting instant daily feedback. So. I like that. You know what I mean? A lot of times people are in their jobs and they may not hear from their boss or their leader or their customers. You know, we're getting it every day. So I like that. And then, of course, it just went over the line with stuff like this. So, you know, I don't know how you fight that. I mean, like the way I battle it now is that, OK, I use any and all platforms to scream at the top of my lungs what my forecast is. And that's the only thing I can do. But I tell you, I, I'm not shy about going on air, you know, because, you know, you'll get even city officials that'll come on and they'll say, well, you know, this was this was bigger than we thought it would be. I'm like, no, it wasn't. No, this is exactly what we talked about. So I don't have any problem coming off of a mayor soundbite in the broadcast and be like, Mr. Mayor, with all due respect, that's not what we said. So, I mean, yeah, so that's all you can do. But you'll I've go crazy not, if you. I've never forgiven Mike Bloomberg before Hurricane Sandy. Right. Right. I mean, that was, you know, that was. Yeah, that. That, you, you've now you, you've now triggered some memories back for me. Lee. <laughs> I, 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 um, Sorry. No, no, no. But but yeah. But we 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 saw we saw um re- just recently the governor of Maine threw the National Weather Service under the bus. Okay. Yeah. Which was which is is a downright right lie. Joe, you and I remember mid November. What was it? Twenty eighteen. Was it mid November twenty eighteen? With governor the Murphy. Six inch. Yeah, the the heavy wet snowfall, uh, three to six inches, and 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 all the local politicians throwing all the weather people under the bus. Okay, mm-hmm. never mind that the night before there was a winter weather advisory. Never mind that at least if they were watching our show. Um, yes, and that was really all about the fact that the reason why they didn't salt or brine or have plows was because it happened in November, yep. and they don't budget for November for snowfall mm-hmm. in most counties in downstate New York. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's um, I, I'm happy to, you know, because I, I, you got to hit back. And I, I was I was so happy to see the weather service when they hit back with the governor of Maine and said, you know, pretty much said, well, let's see. We had flood watches up three days before we mentioned the fact that it could be catastrophic rainfalls, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Et cetera. What more do you want? You know, yes. really, what more a, do you want? Somebody- we had somebody like that, Lee, at uh, at the National Weather Service in New York, back in the day when it was at 30 Rockefeller Plaza, a uh, gentleman by the name of Tom Grant. And in fact, Tom was uh, one of my professors. He was an adjunct professor at City College. Uh, mm-hmm. 
And, but uh, Joe knew him uh, also for the National Weather Service. And whenever the, we had a situation where there was a lot of controversy, Tom would like literally like stand at attention and list all of the things that the Weather Service had said versus what the newspapers were saying that they didn't say. And uh, he, he was really a, a great guy. He was also the shop steward, I think, for uh, yes, he was. For the, uh, and he was and great. <laughs> and he was always great about in the in the weather map discussion in, in the winter time, lecturing landlords to make sure that they had the heat turned up for the <laughs> <laughs> under ex extreme conditions. Say, so a number of the folks on the chat board have got some questions, and I okay. um, so I'm going to pass a couple of them along. Um, we're going to start with uh, Tom Contino's question, which he thought he was going to miss this show, uh, but uh, he thought it was last night, but I told him it's tonight. So he's on the chat board and he says, um, what is your routine before going on the air? What time does, does Lee arrive at the station? What models and tools do you use? Does he make his own hmm. graphics? Does he get briefed by AccuWeather verbally or through Zoom? Does he ever go rogue and go against the AccuWeather reporters? Now, I would just start. Wow. I, I would just say, uh, you know, Tom, you ask an awful lot of questions for somebody from Quorum. OK, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> so if you would like well, to I... tackle any or all of those, I hope you had your notepad and wrote all of them down, Lee. Yeah, uh, well, listen, uh, one thing and, and we sort of had discussions about this in, in the office is that. Uh, the day gets longer and longer now. Um, I actually hop on a morning Zoom at 9 a.m. Uh, when our station is doing the editorial meeting because I, I like to hop on and kind of set the, the tone for the weather message of the day. So I'll, I'll, I'll post a couple of graphics, talk about the themes, just so all of the teases and, and, and promos going forward through the day are, are sending the right message. So that's the first thing I want to do is lay the foundation for that. Um, and I'll do a little bit of forecasting in the morning, you know, even while I'm working out, I'm, I'm just looking at stuff since things are so readily available. Um, I will always put together my own information. Uh, we are an AccuWeather brand. Uh, there are some fantastic meteorologists at, at AccuWeather and, um, they're, they're great to bounce ideas off of. And, and I almost look at them as like a, another piece of guidance, um, I get to see what their thoughts are and, you know, what goes on air in my shows or, or what I forecast. Um, I'm in the studio by one, probably one and one fifteen. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll again, brief my producers on what's going on. I'm a one man band. I, I do all my graphics. Um, back good. in the That's day, we, 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 do, well, I feel like it's, you know, you're reading your own writing. Um, right. And what's very funny, Joe, is that I can go back actually to when I was new in the market and watching you and I really hadn't put too many um, – I hadn't put steering winds. I hadn't done a lot of jet graphics. And I remember like, wait, I, I can do a blocking discussions because you always used to do – I always remember that. And so I, I started incorporating that in a little bit. Um, but I, I like that's one of the parts of the job I like. But when I started, I wasn't doing the 4, 5, 6, 11. So the amount of production, if I want these shows to be – different to have variety listen to frankly keep my own interest in the midst of dozens of hits here during the evening i think you have to make it different and i like the idea especially in this type of pattern being able to look forward and you know look at some of the teleconnections things happening in other parts of the world all this interesting stuff but that takes a lot of time so um i don't mind being a one-man band but it's it, it's becomes a lot and then you you throw in the streaming and the podcast stuff which now has gotten there it's just, you know, I don't leave here till 1130. So it's it's really kind of all from Monday through Friday. By the time I'm getting to Friday night, I'm like, OK, I got to shut it down well, the, as the much days, as I, and I still love every minute of it. But it's 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 a lot. The days of just walking in and doing one show, you know, were long gone. I mean, they've, they've been long no. gone for a long, long time. I, I, I'm, I'm like, I'm. God, I'm speechless bringing up um, the fact that you watched me and, and, and doing uh, my Joe Stradamus on the weekend, I, love I would it. go to the long range, which uh, unfortunately I had. To, I was told I couldn't do that anymore, oh. um, for reasons that we could get into off camera. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember, I, listen, I lived in Rybrook, and and then we we moved into you know we stayed in the Hudson Valley, and so I I had uh, I had Joe Rayo on, on my News Twelve, so it was uh, I was spoiled. No, well, thank you very much for that. I, I I just wanted to point out that Joe and I. 
when we were working at News 12 Long Island before Westchester and Hudson Valley came along, I was uh, a stringer at Long Island back in the uh, late 80s and 90s. Uh And Joe was the morning meteorologist there. But Cablevision, which at that time owned News 12, had AccuWeather as the, uh, the source of information. They would fax the forecast over and uh, one of the uh, meteorologists would call for weather discussion. But one of the people there was not a meteorologist. So more or less AccuWeather was there for him. And mm-hmm. I was stringing on weekends and they would call and send me a forecast. I just very politely say, thank you very much. Uh, I'll be interested to know what you're what what you're forecasting, uh, but uh, more or less I'm going to be taking over, and and whatever I put up there is going to be what I'm thinking of. Because really, it's it's it, what, what was that commercial that they used to have? If if you, if, if it's your if it's your name is on it, then you have to you have to you know, own it. Said, you have to own it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you have to own it if your name is on it. I, I for me it was always about well when they set up News Twelve, especially with the you know this was at a time. You know, we're talking about mid 1980s, and you had mm. a lot of 1970s New York mentality people that put together f- from the producer side. This is not a criticism; this is just reality. Yeah. And weather was was low priority, if if a priority at all. Yeah, right. and, and and I I came I came up here um, from New Orleans. I had worked at Corpus Christi, then I worked in New Orleans, okay. and especially in New Orleans, where weather was, you know, that was the most important part of the show. I mean, we were guaranteed three and a half minutes every night. Uh, so when I came up up here to News 12 and saw what a bare bones operation that they they were doing as far as weather is concerned, I I just kind of felt that I needed to just take you know complete control more to protect mm-hmm. myself, you know, from from you know where my career would 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 wind up going than anything else sure uh so you know there was i was like no i don't want somebody else doing my forecast forecasting for me mm-hmm. i I'm, this is this is what i wanted to do all my life i didn't want to have you know be a mouthpiece for somebody else but it was a different world then because like yeah. i said that was just sort of one show you just did it and you know the mindsets the mindsets were totally were totally different um but you know these days it's it's a wonder that most people that work on the air have any time to even for, to do the, the the in-depth work of forecasting with all the other stuff that they have they they make you do between Facebook lives and 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 uh, you know a, a, a separate podcast for this or a separate podcast for that and you know then you got to do a sh- you got to do a three-hour newscast where you're on every ten minutes you know somewhere along the line you get to eat and go to the bathroom. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's a whole different, it's a whole different world. Yeah. You know, you know, th- thank goodness. So uh, we love the topic, you know, otherwise it would be pretty grueling. Um, you know, the, the thing is, and, and I think this is why in particular, uh, this station's weather team has, has been so successful. The number one, I had some big shoes to fill coming in. Um, of course, Sam champion had been in the main slot for a long time. I was doing weekends for about 10 years and, um, they, uh, they, they've always given us the freedom and the, you know, the, the, the editorial power, whether it's to, you know, shape our, our, our message within our weather cast or the certain tools that they provide, um, you know, our weather message has always been paramount. So I, I feel like we're, yes, weather was less of a, pro- less of a priority in New York when I got here in the mid nineties, but I already feel like we were ahead of the game in terms of how aggressive we were, not in, in hyping a forecast, but yet um, putting the meteorologist higher in the broadcast, starting to become more of a staple of an early word in the newscast. And then by the time we really started to ramp up the su- sort of new supercharged era of weather, uh, we were already running. So um, I've been very thankful for that with this station over the years. And you were in Syracuse, right, uh, Lee? Uh, you were in the uh, Syracuse market before you came to New York. I When I was at Cornell... Um, Wayne Mahar, who a, a longtime uh, Syracuse weathercaster, um, yeah. had a, a, a radio service. Uh, I think he still does, actually. We, and he had me in my college map room doing radio forecasts and utility forecasts. And there was one winter where um, he, he called me up to Syracuse and he said, listen, um, we, we have some room for some fill-in TV. I know you haven't graduated, but I see that you're doing Ithaca College TV and you have broadcast work. 
how about uh, coming in and filling in, you know, every once in a while. I said, great. Well, Wayne had an operation on his voice box uh, my junior year into senior year of college. And I ended up having 50 shows in Syracuse on WSTM uh, the summer of my junior year into senior year. And then that just rolled into the blizzard of 93. So Syracuse was an incredible market. It's been a pipeline into New York for a long, long time incredibly talented photojournalists and, and um, newscasters and reporters. So I, I was very lucky there. And there was a, a, an ad in broadcasting and cable for a weekend meteorologist at WABC. And I just said, you know, listen, I'll, I'll send my stuff, see if I can get some feedback. Uh, and it turns out the assistant news director at the time was the news director in Boston where I interned. So he called Harvey Leonard and said, I like the kid's stuff. He's a little young. You think he can handle it? And Harvey gave him the thumbs up. And next thing you know, I was working down in New York. That's fantastic. That's, that's a great story. That's a great story. Yeah, it, yeah, it, uh, very lucky. Mine is, uh, mine is somewhat like that in that I was working at News 12. And Don Hausman, who was the executive producer at Channel 11, lived in Massapequa. And he used to watch News 12. And he used to watch me all the time. I didn't know this. He told me this afterward. And um, he um, was instrumental when the opening happened to channel 11, when the weekends opened mm -hmm. up to channel 11, he was, you know, he got me in and, you know, I've, I've known, you know, worked with John there. And then mm -hmm. uh, when we, when I went to Fios, I, I, I got to, I got to get to work, get to work in Fios because, because John was there uh, also. So it's good to have a Godfather. <laughs> and no, means everything. It Mr. means everything. Mr. Ruben Fairchild who is one of our semi-regulars here. Um, yeah. Uh, he uh, tends to executive produce this show uh, from uh, on the chat board. Would like You'd to love know, him, Lee. He, he doesn't think we, 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 we do this show five nights a week, but he says you got to go seven nights a week and you have to go longer than what you normally right. go. <laughs> he also wants me to build a new set and, yeah. you know, do <laughs> Do a, do like a twenty four hour seven you know simulcast thing or whatever. Anyway, he uh, he asked. I I guess it's probably one of the most important questions that we could ask you, and that is, do you buy your own clothes, or does WABC provide you with your wardrobe, and where do you shop because you're a snazzy dresser? That's very nice of you. Um, uh, I. Pay for my own clothes. WABC, uh, it's been a long history where they feel like they compensate you enough to buy your own clothes. Um, so uh, the, the days of like, um, you know, clothing allowances, that's that's a long time ago. Yeah. Um, but I met my uh, my gift to myself when I got the job here in New York was to find a suit maker. Uh, and he happened to be on the east side um, uh, named David Lance. He's still in business today. And I uh, found him. He made me a custom suit, and then I've never left him left him since. So, so yeah, that's still David Lance right there in the wow, suit. So yeah, he. You, I mean, got, you have, you, you have too, your own tailor. That is so. That's that's well, snazzy. That's cool. Well, listen, you can't you can't tell on TV in here, but I'm five foot nothing. So if I wear a suit off the rack, I look like basically an intern who's walked in, and and I, oh. you know, not nothing against interns, but you know, we're not tailored. So I have to wear something that fits right. Well, and it's great the, uh, what you what you have there, uh, Lee. Uh, when you make your nightly presentations, I mean, you have. I mean, Joe and I, we just would stand in front of the Cromer wall, and that was pretty much it for us. But I mean, you stand and and you've got like an entire room that seemingly is uh, uh, virtual, so to speak. And it really well, is going to be very impressive. Well, we're fighting the small, you know, the the uh, shrinking attention spans of, of everybody out there when it comes to weather. So it's different visuals, different graphics, different sets. I actually like the augmented reality. Um, you know, I, I, it's not that I stay there for a whole weather cast. And I, and I, but I think it's more than eye candy. I think it's an, a nice way to, in, in a three-dimensional world to show some weather processes, some, you know, uh, tease some things going forward or do i do like a standard drought report during those seasons i yeah i just like and it, again i just think it's it's interesting and we have a set that's conducive for it so thank you and you do a lot of uh, stuff uh and this this was my forte when i was at news 12 
I'm always impressed by the fact that you'll mention, let's say, uh, a conjunction between the moon and a couple of bright planets or, you know, astronomical things. And that's that, a lot of the people who used to email me or write to me used to say, I, I love when you talk about that kind of stuff. I'd step outside and I'd see it and they'd say, oh, Joe Rayo said there's Jupiter in the sky. And you do a lot of that stuff. And I, I, I see a little of myself in, in you when you when you do that. Well, Joe, uh, I appreciate that coming from you, uh, the expert on the on the on the night sky. Um, I, it is something that people still love. And just my biggest fear is after I do present that is a correction email from you, because I, I fear that because it, <laughs> did I, you know, as so, so as long as I don't get that in the first five, 10 minutes after I show it, I, I feel much better. No, but uh, Lee is always on target. But. I will mention that a few weeks ago they had a story about the upcoming eclipse of the sun, and the yes. only problem, the only problem that they, with that story or with that news package was that they were talking about a solar eclipse and they were showing uh, graphics of the moon going into a total eclipse. Yeah, that's that's not a small mistake. So you were you were warned. Yes. Uh, I just want to. I just got to take a quick minute just to do some fast business. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. So and, and I just want to thank. Uh, the folks who hit the uh, super chat tip jar tonight, Birder Lady, thank you so much. Uh, nice. Bilbo Swaggins, uh, thank you. He says I haven't seen Lee. I uh, haven't seen Lee since I moved upstate four years ago. Nice to see one of the goats of weather, greatest of all time, yeah. in good spirits. Thanks for making this happen, Joe and Joe. Joe nice. Lapresti, thank you. Uh, Anthony Sparaccio, welcome Lee Goldberg to the Joe and Joe Weather Show. Sal Patchy. Uh, A big Joe and Joe welcome to Lee Goldberg, one of the goats of the New York City weather world. Awesome to see you on. David Carter, a longtime fan. Lee, uh, longtime fan, Lee. Compliments on your backyard remote set. Um, Thank you. uh, Joe Lapresti again. Uh, Thanks for having Lee on. And David Fuller, uh, good evening, Joes. And Lee, glad you're with us tonight. I hope you come back again soon. Well, so far. Thank you. So far, he's still here. So it's good. (laughs) We haven't frightened him away. Joe, you need to ring the bell. Oh, yes. Well, I didn't want to ring it while, you know, I didn't want to ring any, uh, you know, interrupt Lee during his uh, thing. But whenever we get 100 likes and then 200 likes, Lee, it's a, it's a little uh, tradition for us to uh, ring ring the bell. And, and uh, I, right I, now, I, and I don't know why I just I, I just got a craving for Cold Stone Creamery. Uh, That's great. <laughs> right, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and after the after the show's over, I make an appointment with the audiologist uh, from, from, the, from the bell ring. Um, so a lot of people oh, on the chat board, Lee, are asking about what your opinion is about this next impending weather atrocity uh, for early next week. <laughs> what do you what 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 are your ideas and what are your thoughts uh, as to what? I, I, uh, by the way, I could put up some maps if you'd like. I, you know, I may do that while you're talking. Sure. Reference no. anything, okay. No, no, no. Feel free. I mean, listen, I I think in the end, its main role is to be a gateway to a wintry pattern. So, you know, that's kind of just like I'm watching, you know, the the NAO kind of go from positive to neutral. I I like seeing these transition times, uh, you know, always kind of a ripe time to see a storm situation. But as much as I've seen, you know, a sign of like, okay. This storm can deepen. There's a way to get heavy snow. We can dynamically cool. We can have bombogenesis. I, you know, look look at the season so far. How much we've struggled. So coming out of this mild stretch, are we really going to have uh, a big snowfall? You know, maybe in the interior, maybe in higher elevations if the storm track is close enough. Um, and I'm not saying that it's off the table. I just don't think it's as likely now with all that said again i'm just sort of putting broad strokes out because the main building block for this thing is in the aleutian islands so it's not even on the grid yet when it gets on the grid i think you know our guidance will start to help us out a little bit i mean remember this started out looking like a cutter then it was a suppressed miss and all along it's very funny i've seen that though a lot of times in the long range is like you know that's what's crazy about forecasting is is we can give you a feel week 10 days out there might be a storm on the board you know early next week and then we go into this no man's land phase where right. that's where the whole no dissipation and, and all of the 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 opinions come in and really 
we're in this period now until the next, really another 48 hours. And, and then we maybe can start narrowing things down. But, I, you know, listen, I like the idea of, of, of maybe a beginning as, as rain and maybe we can have a little wintry thump on the backside and maybe it's more elevation dependent. But, um, well, you know, like uh, I said, they, at least it gets us back into a winter pattern. Now, Joe, uh, I, I asked you I asked you before about my ability of being able to share a screen. This, at least, yeah. this at least may find this of interest. I know all of you on the chat board or who are watching, who are especially snow lovers, will find this of interest. This is a, a I, you know, when I do a, a forecast, you know, long range, I don't look at such things as um, uh, uh, so much as what Joe does with the NAO or the AO, whatever. I like to look at numbers. Uh, okay. and, and interestingly, in the 155 years of record keeping at Central Park, the, this particular December, January period, 2023 into 2024, those two months are among the top 10 in terms of the wettest or the most precipitation that has fallen in those two months in particular, December, January. And you can see the list here. Uh, we, mm -hmm. had, we had in December, January, 11.99 inches of, 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 of liquid precipitation, which places us number seven on this list of the top 10. Now- okay. Those of you who are snow weenies or uh, snow lovers immediately, I know, are drawn to two particular time frames, 77, 78 and 78, 79. 77, 78, we had the two big snowstorms and the blizzard of 78. 78, 79, we had the famous President's Day storm uh, of uh, 79. And you're looking at this and you're probably saying, well, if that be the case, uh, how did all of those <laughs> other years stack up in terms of snowfall? In other words, you know, we, we had very wet December, January. What was the total amount of snow for that particular season? Well, guess what, <laughs> boys and girls? Here are the numbers. Um, 78, 79, 29.4 inches. And of course, most of that was from that President's Day storm. 77, 78, we had the two biggies, one on January 20th. And then the blizzard on February 6th of 78, 50.7 inches, all at Central Park. I know a lot of you are starting to cry now, thinking about what's going on so far this year. Of course, we don't know what's eventually going to happen for this year, but these are the numbers in terms of snowfall. And you say hmm. to yourself, well, if that be the case, certainly if it's a similar pattern in terms of precipitation, maybe this is not going to be a lost cause this particular winter season. Ah, but wait a minute. Precipitation is only one half of the uh, one half of the ingredients. You need cold temperatures, and here are the temperatures for each one of those years. These wow. are the average, these are the average temperatures that occurred in December and January. So you see here, for example, seventy eight, seventy nine, thirty six point three degrees. Mm -hmm. Again, that's the average of both December and January, which averaged out about nine tenths of a degree above normal. Uh, what about that big year of seventy seven, seventy eight? 50.7 inches. Well, of course, it was cold that winter. December, January, average temperature 31.9, 3.5 degrees below normal. Take a look at what we have going so far this year. With 11.99 inches for Je December and January, so far, if you take December and January, the average temperature 40.8 degrees, that's 5.4 degrees above normal. Mm. And yeah. that pretty much tells the story about why we perhaps haven't seen. I mean, take a look at this, 36, 1936, 37, 13 and a half inches of rain, but only 15.6 inches of snow for the entire yeah. winter season. Why? They averaged four degrees above normal for December and January. And I guess they yeah. followed through with the rest of the sea. But let me also point out, it's not necessarily true that the colder it gets, the more snow you get. Take a look at 1981, 82, 11.64 inches, 24.6 inches of snow that's that's below average the temperature that winter uh, for uh, the temperature for december and january 31.3 degrees that was 4.1 degrees below normal and yet we still ended up with below normal snowfall probably because it was so cold and dry that a lot of those storms probably passed underneath us or off to our south mm. so what we have to hope for if you're if you're still in this for uh, for a possible you know big snow season what i guess you're gonna have to hope for was not necessarily a 
a, 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 a front-loaded winter, maybe a back-loaded winter. Maybe we'll, we'll see something, if not maybe later this month, hopefully. Keep your fingers crossed, snow lovers. We might get a March snowfall. And some mm-hmm. years, as was the case back in 1982 when we had a blizzard on April the 6th, maybe we might even get a snowfall, a big snowfall uh, in uh, early April. It's not impossible, but uh, it certainly is something that uh, one might want to uh, watch. That, you know, that's a fascinating analog analysis. I love that. And and the one thing that screams to me is that, OK, um, you know, maybe we still continue on that loaded precipitation. And, and when the subtropical jet is, is still a great contributor, the problem is with all this front loaded warmth, any marginal situation, which let's say we don't get the degree of cold we get in January. So any marginal situation where maybe we have that opportunity, our ocean isn't going to help the situation based on the warmth that we've had leading up. It just hasn't gotten cold enough. So, and I just wor- I wonder, I worry about the boundary layer for the rest of the winter. And I wonder if, you know, it, it'll, it'll just it's, uh, it's, it's it'll all issue. be interior. It's an yep. issue. And you touched upon a couple of things that, 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 um, I was looking at during the day today uh, that uh, I thought were, were important with this system for early next week. And I, I, I want to go back and I, I'm gonna, I have it up on the screen. This is the upper air for off the, the 6Z run from last night, which was the mm-hmm. one that had, you know, the blue, the blue on tropical tidbits for snow was so, so dark. It was black. Right. I mean, <laughs> you know, so you know, all the snow lovers are just pulling up every snow map they could find. But the thing right. I noticed, the thing I noticed right off the bat when I saw this was that okay, um, we're 132 hours out. You have a, a northern stream short wave, and you have a really vigorous southern stream short wave. And right. when it moves along, you get this sort of negatively tilt, negative tilt, and, and the southern stream short wave begins to actually deepen, and an upper low closes off at southern New Jersey. I looked at this and I said, where did I, where have I seen this before? And I thought, I've seen this at least three or four times in the last month and a half, where the models were mm. doing something like this inside the seven-day time frame, and it turned out to be absolute BS. So I thought, at, at which point, I, decided, I guessed that the next run was not going to look anything like this. That plus the fact that, to me, this would have been the perfect run. This was the so-called perfect run at 150 hours out so you cannot right. you're not going to get so right off the bat i would rather see the imperfect at 150 hours when the model puts mm-hmm. it is pretty much what you think is the, the the most favorable setup for a big snowfall 150 hours out you know that it's not going to be like this mm-hmm. and sure enough and sure enough on the on the on the very next run uh you have uh, the Southern Streams feature, while still vigorous, it you know it doesn't really live up to uh, the run before. The Northern mm-hmm. Stream jet's more important, and you're going to wind up like the last the last few the last couple of storms, the ones we had in January. I, I'm a firm believer, and you brought brought it up what you, what you said, Lee. The, the trend is your friend, uh, and you stick with it until something comes along to break it. And I don't see how this doesn't behave uh, any differently than the other ones. And that, to me, says that if you're if you're north of if you're north of Route 84 in upstate New York and up into mm-hmm. say northern Connecticut and points northward, you've got a shot. But if you're south of mm-hmm. there, um, I just don't think it's going to happen. There's no there's no cold air there's no cold air on the front end. That's that and that's another problem. If there was some cold mm-hmm. air on the front end, I think we could make have a different conversation. The other thing I will agree with you, with, however, because I've been, Joe will tell you, uh, in the last week, because we've been talking about everything leading up to this, and <sighs> excuse me, everybody talking about pattern change and all the rest of it, I have been really guarded about <clears throat> next week with regards to, you know, getting overly enthused about getting cold and all the rest of it. Uh, however, I do agree that this might this system starts the process to put us into I, what I think will be a fairly favorable pattern another week down the road and beyond. So let's just pick a date, say after say February 17th or 18th. I think the last 10 days of February and the first couple of weeks of March 
um, could afford some interesting opportunities along, uh, in, yeah. in that time frame. I think the teleconnections are there. The Arctic Oscillation is going to be almost four standard deviations negative. So, mm-hmm. you know, that's that's usually a good place to be uh, as far as cold is concerned. Now, if you can get a few other things to line up, uh, but as far as this first system is concerned, I mean, unless it goes back to what it had last night, uh, mm-hmm. I, I, I think it's going to be it's going to be inland and north. And as you said, also elevated areas are going to have are, are, are going to have uh, a better shot. Yeah, you know, right. Ten percent that it's the, the rapid deepener that we saw on that run. But we'll see. Um the other thing that was interesting when you talked about the cold, it's funny that you uh, have been guarded about it. You know, I yesterday I was uh, pretty bullish on air. Just, again, talking about this storm is sort of a, a mechanism to start changing back to at least seasonable or to, to below normal. And I, and I came in today and I was like, OK, you know, the first shot behind the system, 850s don't look as bad. It looks like we actually kind of get just brushed by this first piece of polar air. And then, okay, now it looks like Thursday and Friday. So it keeps getting pushed off. Yep. You know, I, I like all, all the signals of stratospheric warming and the polar vortex weakening. I, I still, I like it, but I, I think your your phrase guarded is is correct. I don't want to wish cast, but I, I like what I see. No, and, and, and you just be bringing up the polar vortex. I know the trend in the last bunch of runs, uh, including the Canadian, the, the Canadian model, uh, splitting the polar vortex in two. They all they all seem to now be and, and we've seen it over this winter where it's tried to do it and it didn't really happen. But mm-hmm. the, the models today, last night and today, were actually very aggressive in splitting mm-hmm. the vortex up in about a week from now, a little, a little bit over a week from now. And I think if that happens, uh, we could be in for a very interesting end of the month and, and first half of March, which leads me to another uh, another thing I want to ask you, and I'd be, I'd be interested in your opinion on this. Going into this winter, Joe and I have talked have talked about the fact that over the course of this past year that we've seen a lot of what I would re- describe as weird things happening. And by that, I mean um, weather, weather rules that we often live by seem to not be working very well. For example, we had a uh, a uh, blossoming El Nino during the summer and fall, fall months, which should, have, which should have meant a subdued hurricane season. And it was mm-hmm. anything but in terms of the total numbers. <sighs> Excuse me. Last, um, last year, uh, from January into, through March, we had a La Nina pattern that on the West Coast behaved more like an El Nino pattern than anything else. And uh, then you had the storms in December uh, with the with rain and and, and uh, you know you've got this you, you, they're, they're, you had the the week where we had back to back major storms go to the Great Lakes. Uh, that was another thing that was sort of strange is you don't often see two sub 980 lows within a span of four days taking virtually identical paths. And, and there's a whole slew of things that have happened not just here but worldwide and mm-hmm. I, I just wonder what you think about the idea that that you know this winter I thought was going to wind up being strange in a lot of ways, and I just wonder whether we're still in for more strangeness. Yeah, no, I, it's, like you said, trend is your friend. Uh, yeah, there there is no question in recent years that there's been like a complete recalibration. You know, that there the, the rules of thumb that I mean, whether I learned it in school or executed it coming out in the first ten years of my career. They don't apply, um, you know, whether it's, you know, the atmospheric oceanic interaction because of temperature differences, whether it, it ha- is related to climate change or not. I don't know. What I do know, though, is is that in terms of the scales of things that are happening, you know, old storms that, OK, you know, we, we, we'd forecast top end wind gusts of 50 miles an hour, a damaging threshold. And now it's, you know, you're getting these storm reports that you don't bat yeah. an eye at 70, 80 miles an hour. Right. Um, pre- precipitation rates that are just absurd and you get that the, the September flooding event that we had uh, I just you know this is not something you know we ever dealt with basically it, it's a, a year-round severe weather season so no, you know nothing's nothing's off the table there's no off season anymore no there isn't and I and from the standpoint of the of, of, of the conversation surrounding climate change the way I've I've, I've approached it is because it becomes a very 
um, sets people off. Yes. In, in, in both directions. And when I'm when I'm asked the question, I just I make a distinction. I said, you know, you're asking me a question about, but somebody asked me, well, is climate change real or it's not real? And I said, look, here's how I'm going to answer the question. There's a there's a there's a there's a scientific mathematic data answer, and then there's the, a political answer. Okay, we're mm-hmm. not gonna we're not gonna go down the political road of the political answer because I'm not right. interested in that. If you're asking me if the if the Earth has warmed, the answer is yes. We've had right. not only two degrees of warming, but we've had, you know, you have an El Nino. So let's take two degrees of warming, put another two degrees of warming on top of that with the El Nino. And then we had that Tonga undersea volca- volcanic eruption, which I, I can't, you cannot overstate the impact of sending all that water vapor into the stratosphere. That has added mm-hmm. potentially another two degrees on top of that. So if you mm-hmm. don't think that putting six degrees on top of, you know, put the two and then add another four. If you don't think that that destabilizes the atmosphere worldwide, then you're mm-hmm. kidding yourself. And that's yep. you know, that that's sort of beyond the idea of saying, well, climate always changes. All right, yep. maybe it does, but there are things going on here that I think a lot of folks, you know, that a lot of scientific folk, folks that are, that work with this stuff are having a tough time trying to figure out what it all means. You, you know. I- I think one of the reasons for your listeners tonight that why there should be an increased level of trust in the meteorological community, whether it be broadcast or whatever it may be, is that, you know, we, to me, we're very slow to sort of come around. We, we want to use the word guarded. You know, there was a time when I asked my producers, could you just not put the climate change story right before my weather cast? And, you know, and now, you know, it, it's to a point where I really feel like uh, we have a, a great responsibility to kind of, um, you know, de- decipher the truth through everything that comes out and, and acknowledge um, not necessarily, like you said, the political side, but say, listen, I'm seeing the supercharged weather you're seeing. I'm seeing the changes I'm seeing. The, the forecast verify in worst case scenarios more often than not. So I'm not turning a blind eye to that. And then, like you said, whatever the data is, I'll present it. You know, you can make your own decisions as to what it was caused by. And if, you know, I can never argue against a green movement. So that's fine. Conservation, right. whatever, anything like that. But yes, we you know when I mentioned that, I'm saying, listen, we whether, whether you want to put the term climate change on it or not, warmer world, obviously some impact. I, I think I think the one thing that people seem to have trouble with is they seem to think that it's 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 binary. It's it, it's yes. either or. Uh, no, it can be both. OK, it can be a natural. You know, I always kind of describe it as if you look at a stock market chart that goes from lower right to uh, um, I'm sorry, lower left to upper right. OK, you're in an uptrend. All right, you're in an uptrend. Let's call it a yeah. cyclical uptrend, and right. you know you're getting these bumps that are going above the trend line. The trend Correct. Line. So it can be both. I think people. I think people in general, for some reason, seem to think that it's e- it's it's an either or, either or thing. It's not. Uh, it it can be both. It can be both cyclical and it can be secular. Okay, and I think I and it took me a long time. Truthfully, I I, I struggled with it for a long time because. Mm-hmm. The, the political part of the conversations, which is where it always would go into, correct, w- was a big turnoff for me, because ultimately it would just become an attack, and I don't mm-hmm. do well when I have when somebody tries to you know get my back up. So, um, so I've kind of div- you know sort of subdivided it into this this logical way of looking at it, uh, but it, people have trouble with the fact that they can't seem to think that it can be all those things, cyclical mm-hmm. and secular. And I, and that's where I think we're at right now. I, yep. I did a I did a two part series for News Twelve about ten years ago called Climate of Concern, and I played the role more of a reporter as opposed to a meteorologist. And I interviewed people like Jeff Tong over at the National Weather Service, who's now retired, uh, mm-hmm. asking questions. Uh, and uh, you know, I, we we showed, and we sometimes Joe and I we kid we 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 we'd kid about this about it immediately after. Hurricane Sandy. We had a clip on uh, this report 
of Governor Cuomo saying, you know, before Sandy, we didn't have I hurricanes. No, 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 I do. I, I do it, right? We yeah. never had snowstorms in upstate New York before. <laughs> we never had hurricanes before hurricanes. <laughs> Go ahead. It's all yours. I mean, like, he, he said that we never had storms in New York. When New York City was being built, we didn't have storms. Right. And what I did to answer that, I didn't go directly to Governor Cuomo, but to answer that, uh, I went to one of David Ludlam, who was a great weather historian, and found, going back, like, to the 1700s, like 200 different storms that mm. flooded, flooded New York City out, almost destroyed Coney Island, tropical systems or whatever. And he said, well, Governor Cuomo, we beg to differ on what you just said. This, this is not something new. But the thing that got me in big trouble was in the second half, the, the part two of this report, we went to a local uh, meteorologist up here in uh, the Hudson Valley. And I showed him a copy of Time Magazine from 40 years ago, which showed Archie Bunker or a caricature of Archie Bunker on his favorite chair, but frozen to the chair because 40 years ago, the talk was that we were heading for another ice age. And now, of course, there's wow. another, another, another uh, cover from Time Magazine more recently talking about, you know, here's a penguin on one little patch of ice and beware, here comes global warming. And I asked, mm. I asked this guy, uh, this guy, I asked this meteorologist who's been around for about 50 years, I said, so what's the story? Why is it that yeah. four years ago we were on our way toward an ice age <laughs> and now these same people are saying that we're in the midst of global warming? And he said, uh, what he said got me in big trouble. He looked straight into the camera and said, because they really don't know, Joe. Oh, my God. Within two days, I had hundreds of people emailing me saying, how could you let somebody like that say something when we all know? that we're in global warming now and that it's, it's a, we're never turning back and the whole bit wow. and that nobody and and like there was more than a few people saying to me in email she says i'm gonna i'm gonna get get you a try i'm gonna get you fired mm. how responsible is that that you put somebody like that on your you know and again i didn't play the role of meteorologist i didn't answer him sure. back say, you know well how could you say something like that i just simply let him go and 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 mm. he's talking about sunspots and how the lack of sunspots uh, means colder weather and that we're heading for solar minimum and a whole bit like that. But mm. after that, it was like knives and pitchforks for, for many, many days. It got me so worried that I went to my news director, Janine Rose, and I, she could tell, I, what are you so worried about, Joe? What are you, and what, basically she said, you know, Joe, you've done a number of science reports for over, over the years. Did you ever get a response like this? I said, no, I never mm. have. She says, well, that's what we're looking for, Joe. That's what mm -hmm. they, they loved. They loved the controversy at at least at at, uh, at News Twelve when they got all of these people coming at you and 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 reacting. Whereas yeah. all the reports I've ever done before, I didn't get much of a reaction. Now all of a sudden, people were screaming at me, and and, and the assistant news director and the news director said, "Don't worry about it. Your job is not in jeopardy or whatever like that." But still, I, after that, a few of my a few of the local people uh, uh, who work here in this market. When I told him what I was going to do, I was going to do a report on global warming and climate change. He said, yeah. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't touch mm. that, Joe. I wouldn't do mm -hmm. that. And I learned, and I learned my lesson with, with that two-part uh, two report or two-part series. Yeah, it's been a hot potato, no doubt. Yep. Hey, um, I, I'm curious about this suddenly popped into my head. So, you know, you being, uh, having, having been at WABC for 28 years and got willing you'll be there for 28 more um and i'm thinking you know joe and i you know because we you know both of us started you know in the in the late i started in the late 70s joe started joe was already in radio at the time and then started in tv a little bit later you know we saw a whole slew of changes in terms of um TV weather and, and how, you know, what it was as far as being part of the newscast and how it has sort of eventually morphed and being, you know, the most important elements. And I'm wondering, how, how what do you see? And now we've got social media and all the rest of it. Where do you see this all going in, say, 10 years from now? Because Joe and I are still going to be here. 
with our social, <laughs> with oh. our meta with our Medicare cards and our social security checks, and hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, we'll still have our teeth. Um, but where do you see where do you see it going? I mean, as long as you as long as you keep that goatee, Joe. I've just been admiring that all evening long. I mean, I can't you. even do that. I mean, give me months, I couldn't do anything like that. So, well, um, the, the beauty of being having your own pod, the, the beauty of having your own podcast. I could do you, you went the. I, you can see you how I dress. Right, you can see how I dress for the show tonight. So, um, because because I look at this sometimes when I look at what's going on on TV. And I and I don't uh, to be honest I um, I live here in I live in North Georgia, uh, so I see okay. I, I see a lot of Atlanta television. And okay. I just don't you know when I watch you know, they do a lot of weather here and they have you know mm-hmm. all the stations have a ton of weather people. I don't know I seem like when I watch the shows there's something missing. It's the sort of everything is about telling people to wear sweaters when it's cold and wearing gloves mm. and. You know, and make sure the kids are okay when you put them on the school bus if they're not overdressed or underdressed and all the rest of it. I don't know. I just I wonder sometimes where, you know, what the quality of TV weather is going to be like in the coming ten years. Is it going to be better? Is it going to be worse? Is the app are uh, apps going to take it over? Well, there you hit it. I mean, I don't think we have a choice that it has to get better and continue to evolve faster. I mean, I, I've always thought that after dipping into all the available weather on the mobile devices that it it would filter back to the most credible sources. I still believe that. And that's kind of why I, I I white knuckle, you know, the position I am. And and I feel like it's the, uh, at at least in local news now, that it is to me the most critical conduit to our viewership. So if we fail in that way and and we can't challenge the apps and we can't give anything better than, are you going to wear a sweater tomorrow morning? Then we're in a lot of trouble. So, oh. and, 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 and forget about, but remember AI, AI is around the corner and, and beating the Euro and, and like some of its beta tests and stuff. And, and so, so where do we go there? So um, I still think, and it's the reason why you're going to tune into a Joe and Joe show in the end, you're, you want that voice and whether at least if, it continues to go the way it is. It's not getting any less critical or severe to people's livelihood. So in that way, I still think that we're going to have a place, but, um, but there'll be, um, it'll be survival of the fittest. There's no question well, about you, it. You, you, you're, you're in a particularly interesting, you know, it's always interesting in the world of television. And it's been this, you know, it, it's been on, on this slow decline since the 1980s and then again you get these mm-hmm. occasions where you know kind of levels off for a while and then in the in the uh, early like 2008 when, when the financial meltdown that was another mm-hmm. that was another leg down and then there was a little, the smooth spot and i just wonder with the i mean linear, linear tv is not long for this world um mm-hmm. everything is being streamed and all the rest of it um you know, i'm just I'm, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, I'm also a firm believer in the law of unintended consequences that you might look at something and think that that it looks all dire and somehow something really good comes out of it. And that's sort of where I'm hoping for, you know, the future of of, uh, of television weather and so on, that that's what happens. Listen, the, 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 con- the bottom line, when it comes down to it, the content is still very relevant if, de- if delivered properly. So now it's a matter of, what is the mothership and your particular ownership of your station group? How are they migrating your content? Now we happen to be Disney. So now we have Hulu. We have all these distribution arms. So, right. you know, now you also have, someone in Broadway, now you also have Warner and, and uh, Fox sports with the package deal that they announced, which, you know, which, so, which a lot so of people how, don't even understand, but that's, that's, that's right. That's, that's it's only, it's only today's news. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's an interesting time to be in in in, in television. Um, mm-hmm. There might be other there might be all sorts of weird opportunities that come of it. One of the things I I find interesting too is the fact that when I tell people, and so I had this conversation with someone today. She said, I had my dog down at the dog park, and she said, Oh, I understand you're a meteorologist, and I said, Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and she said, How come my app is never accurate? And I explained to her that I said that most what she asked me. 
Well, she asked me, you know, what's the best weather app? Because all the ones I've used are not accurate. And okay. uh, I, I, I explained to her that the most weather apps have very little human input into them. They're all, you know, mm -hmm. model driven and everything is automatic. And perhaps that's where, as you say, in terms of content, uh, people, when I tell them that, they're kind of amazed. They don't realize that, uh, so, so there's, you, you know, these forecasts that you see are all tied to all sorts of different models, and some come out every hour, and some come out every six mm -hmm. hours, and they're constantly changing. I, I think when it comes to weather, people strive for that. They want that human element. They want mm -hmm. someone that they can sit and listen to and watch, and 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 hopefully walk away with an understanding of of uh, of of what what's going to happen. Uh, so maybe that's I, where I the saying. hope lies. If I may just add add something to the mix here, and Lee has been on for 28 years, and I don't know, Lee, if you get the idea that, you know, how popular you really are. I know that you probably say to yourself, well, I'm on Channel 7, so a lot of people watch me every night or whatever. But really, people who watch, they, they become attached to you. They, they know where they can get uh, good weather information. I, I'm sure that a lot of people say, "Oh, well, what's what does Lee Goldberg say?" Let me. I, I got to tune in and see what what he says because they trust you. That is the biggest thing I think uh, that I learned in my years of uh, being on radio and television is to be trusted. We we or, or better yet, people came up to me and they used to say, "We believe you. We believe." Mm. That I think is the most important uh, facet of uh, doing weather. It went out a machine. We're not spitting out statistics to you. Uh, we're, we're not a nameless uh, face or whatever like that. We, we're, we're people, and people actually, I think, get accustomed to seeing you, which we, and it becomes a habit, tuning you in either at 4 o'clock or at 6.30 or, or, or 5 o'clock. They, they just want to see you, and they want to hear what you have to say, not what anybody else says, but they and – I, and I, you know, like I said, I've learned that. I know Joe – Learn that. I mean, look, I've been off of television now for for quite a few years, and every time I go shopping with my wife, somebody, let's say at at, at uh, Walmart or at the supermarket, and everybody will go come up to me, and they'll say, "Hey, you know, mm -hmm. you know, News." My my other name was News Twelve for many years, <laughs> but I mean, they 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 identify with that, and I say to myself, "How is it? I've been I've been away for so long, but people still." Remember you, and I'm sure the same thing is going to happen with you after whenever we hope that it's not going to be in the immediate future. But when you leave, people are still going to remember you and still going to trust you. And I think that is the thing that the biggest takeaway for anybody who's been on television for a good long time is the fact that people recognize you, remember you and admire you. And uh, I, I'm, I know, Lee, from just looking at the chat board, how happy everybody is that you came here tonight and uh and are just happy to you know identify with you and, and see you and uh and admire you it's 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 and we thank joe and i both thank you for uh, taking time out of yes. your busy schedule and, and my god know, nine o'clock in the morning <laughs> they, they come here and do and do this when you could be sitting down and eating a eating a sandwich and uh you have dinner you know looking at some some other television show when you're uh, uh, I can see it at about two o'clock out on my corner of my eye here, so it's it's waiting for uh, me. Oh, That's oh, okay. it is there. Okay, because we're you know we're we're coming up on we're coming up on eight fifty. We've been on for an hour and twenty minutes, and um, I I think I, I think you need to go eat your dinner. <laughs> yes. I, I let me just tell you something. First of all, um, uh, thank you for what you just said, both of you. Um, you guys paved the way. I, I really appreciate it. Like, I, I, of course, I uh, when I was breaking into the market. I mean, that's that's how I learned. The same way I learned from uh, Harvey and Dickey up in Boston uh, was to watch the best that do it and 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 take little pieces of that and try to help craft your cast. But you know, I got here as a twenty three year old kid. Um, got married at Channel Seven. Did my two kids. The, the tri state area has embraced me for a long, long time, and it's um, that type of legacy. You can't. Uh, you know, you, you just you can't trade that in. It, that's it's no. super special. I, I hope I have many years to come. Um, I'll, I I hope that that my viewers know that I never mail in a forecast. Uh, of course, we're not always, always going to get it right, but that's not because of the 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 brain power I'll try to put into it. Um, so it's uh, 
yeah, it's just I still I still love what I do, even though it's you know a hundred times more than it used to be. It's it's still fantastic. Well, I, I just want to I, I just want to tell you thank you for taking the time to, to come on. Um, it's it's you know having worked in television, I, people you know people seem to think that it's easy to get uh, folks to show up for interviews because our you know our audience would like to see folks come on, and and I often get message emails from some of the, my regular uh, viewers saying well why don't you get this person on why don't you get that person on it's like it's not a, it's it's not easy and um you know you uh you responded and it's great it, 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 it was really great and you know what you said what you said earlier is going to stay with me about the fact that you watched me doing my long-range stuff when i was at fix um, yeah, that, that really made me, I mean, I was, I felt good all day that I was going to do this show with you. Uh, that really made me feel I'm on cloud nine. I'm above that cloud I did good nine. tonight. I'm on cloud 10. It's Thank the you. nicest thing. It's the nicest thing you could have said to first to become purely. And it's a nice thing to say to a couple of old fogies like Joe and, and myself nah. who are grandfathers now. <laughs> and, yes. uh, and you know we 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 paid our dues, and we we just yes. when we we when I, I don't know if, uh, Joe can't see you on a regular basis, but when I watch you, I I say to myself this this guy knows his stuff. Congratulations also on winning your first Emmy, um, which I know is it's it's, it's oh, a very. Did you win the, I was nominee. wondering who won the weather Emmy this this year. You won. It, the it was Emmy? a it was a couple of years ago. I, I hadn't. Uh, I hadn't ever submitted. And, um, you know, during COVID, you, you alluded to the backyard weather segment. What we did was and what my station allowed me to do was take my back patio, turn it into an augmented reality set. And it just instead of just like sort of the standard backgrounds you saw in most weather casts around the country, which were great. We had this. I had an inside outside shoot. I'd be running from my office to the outside. And, and it's actually the one of the good things that come out of COVID is I still you do backyard weather on Fridays on a nice day, and and I still really enjoy it. So, um, yeah, it's it's uh, it, it's, it's it's that's always great. changing. You, want, you, you got one. That's 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 terrific. I have. I um, uh, no, I don't want to. Maybe one day you and I can have a conversation. Like I said, off camera. There's a few things I'd love to tell you. <laughs> God, do I want to? I want to so bad. I really do. I look. I look forward to the after show. That's great. And please, guys, I hope this isn't that. This is the first time, but hopefully not the last time on Joe and Joe. You listen anytime you want. We'd love to have anytime you on again anytime you want. Um, we, we, you know, just just uh, if 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 you know if you're not busy one day and you should say, yeah, you know what, maybe I'll shoot a message over to the the Joe and and. See if he, if he can, I can be on. You have an open door. You, know, you can always I come, in and come on anytime you'd like. Um, Joe, can you ring the bell because we had two hundred likes? Yes, sir. Two hundred. There we go. And Thank you. I sir. Want, and, and also, um, I just want to acknowledge uh, Frank Scalera. Uh, thank you for banging the tip jar. And he says, uh, "I enjoy Lee. I enjoy watching you. You always do a great job." Uh, Mark G, thanks for hitting the tip jar. And he says, thank you, Joe and Joe, for tonight's show. This is great. I can't say how much this does for the weather enthusiast, the weather enthusiast soul. Wish I had this growing up, but happy we have it now. Thank you, Mr. Goldberg, for joining us tonight. And Jason Kaplan, uh, thank you. And he says, great show tonight, Joe's. It's so awesome that Lee joined us tonight. One of the best in the business. And yes, I, uh, I second that. You definitely one of the best in the business that uh, means everything coming from you guys thank you very much all right um all right uh we'll see you at 11, we'll see you at 11 o'clock lee yes <laughs> or i'll we'll all watch you when, when 11 o'clock comes we'll know where we're where we're going to be the spot yeah no what? zero go ahead right. no no you go no you know zero z dead will come in and i'll put out my first snow map it's almost time Yes, it is. <laughs> yes. All right, folks. Thanks everybody for being here tonight. I hope you enjoyed the show, and uh, we'll be uh, Joe and I will be back tomorrow night at the usual time, seven thirty-five p.m. Eastern. Nighty night, everybody. Good night, Thanks, everybody. everybody. <laughs>